Hi guys. It is actually a pleasant fall day, unbelievably. We have a pleasant fall day in the fall of 2021. I think we're at Wednesday already. Are we at Thursday? I have lost track, guys. I think it's Wednesday or Thursday, one or the other. I think it's October 21st. 2021, and uh, as some of you know, I have been absent from the Doomosphere for the past two days, uh, dealing with, what shall we call it, a metaphorical death in my family. <laughs> but anyway, the, the grief process is quickly proceeding apace, but uh, I have been out of the Doomosphere for two days. And uh, just looking over all of my various doom and gloom, my alert leader, alert leaders, yes, my alert listeners and readers have sent me, and uh, we have not checked in with one of my favorite alarmists. Umair, I've never heard the guy's name, H-A-Q-U-E. I call it Hake. Nobody has ever corrected me. Uh... So we're going to see what Umer Hake has to say all about this various, uh, you know, supply chain crunches and labor shortages and corona panic lockdowns and all of this. I think that somewhere in his resume that Umer is some sort of economist. He is certainly a well-read human being. And this is... Uh, Umer Hake's reading of the tea leaves where all of this uh, <clears throat> is leading. The little dog has not been uh, feeling good for two days. This dog has basically not eaten since, when was the last time you ate? Monday? We have a sick little dog going to the vet tomorrow if he doesn't get his appetite back. But anyway... Right now, let's see what is on Umer Hake's mind as I enjoy my planet-saving cup of organic coffee. Title of his essay of today, The Great Inflation of the 2020s. We are on the cusp of one of the greatest inflationary periods in history. It is only just begun, and it is going to get a whole lot worse. Pretty much sums it up. Okay. Give us the uh, give us the bad news, Umer, and you can draw your own dots about what this means for the collapse of your wallet, if not global industrial civilization and a planet. <clears throat> Right about now, an old, old demon is starting to possess the economy. Inflation. The prices of everything under the sun are skyrocketing. In my other life, I am a musician. I did not know that you were a musician, Umir. And I am working with a singer who has an amazing voice. Too bad, though. Microphones, amplifiers, furniture, computers, just a few of the things surging in price, and that is hardly all. Everything from food to fuel is rising swiftly. I noticed uh, the day before yesterday, I drove past a gas station which had gone from 329 to 345 in a week. And then in the 24 hours that it took me to drive the other way, it had gone from 345 to 351 a gallon. We seem to have a cat uh, joining in on the uh, on Umer's rent. He's talking about uh, good luck finding cat food at any price. Uh, cat food is one of these things. Cat, you're just going to go have to eat a mouse. You're a pretty good mouser, and there's plenty of mice for you to eat in this house. I have some bad news, and I have some really bad news. Sorry about that, but it is better that you be prepared. 
the inflation surge hitting the global economy is about to get a whole lot worse. Today's supply chain crisis is already becoming tomorrow's supply chain catastrophe. Prices are not going to fall. They're going to keep right on soaring. For how long? Probably for the rest of your life. But that's not the worst part. By tomorrow, by tomorrow, interest rates have spiked too. Now, now you are growing poorer much faster than you envisioned because you're paying much, much more, not just for goods, but also now for interest. And for most people, deep in debt, that is a mounting cost that they cannot afford. Bang! There goes the economy. That is a tiny portrait of the future. Sadly, I have only just begun, and I just need to break in here about this interest thing. I remember when I went down this rabbit hole in 2008, uh, figuring out the oncoming freight train, the first item on my list of things to do was to pay off every single uh, interest-bearing thing that I had in my life. I, I got rid of, uh, good Lord, uh, four mortgages. I had to sell four houses in 2008, mainly to get rid of the interest-bearing mortgages. And I think I had four credit cards. I do remember my Home Depot credit card uh, was $22,000. I was paying $240 every month just to pay the interest on my Home Depot credit card. <laughs> In 2008, uh, I was paying every month $3,000 in interest uh, the first item on your agenda to prepare for what's coming is get rid of those uh, interest-bearing credit cards. If you cannot afford it, do not buy it. Uh, I have not had a single interest-bearing account in my life now in 13 years and have probably saved easily a half million dollars by getting rid of those uh, damn credit cards. Anyway, back to Umer. Where were we? All of this isn't just about now. It's about the future, the next few decades. It is beginning now, but it's going to be a long-run trend which shapes our lives, rising prices. We're not used to it because we live on the cusp of a bygone age, an age of artificially cheap prices perpetually falling for everything from clothing to electronics to food to fuel. That age is over. The age of cheap stuff is now coming to a close. What follows it? The great inflation does. Let me put this simply as I can, and then explain it a little more clearly. We now have to internalize costs over a few decades, which were externalized over centuries. How long did it take us to bring our civilization to this point of mega fires and mega floods, of climate change and COVID? centuries during which we have been polluting and consuming and depleting and strip mining and annihilating everything from rivers to oceans to animals with no end in sight until we got here. And now we are discovering the hard way 
that there really is a budget constraint, as economists call it, or in plain English, that the planet really does have limits. So now we have to pay for the cost of the industrial age. We are living on a dying planet. Hmm, someone has to clean it up. While the basics, while the basics we've long taken for granted begin to go into shorter and shorter supply as they become harder, riskier, more costly to supply, to source, produce, manufacture, distribute, transport, everything from water to food to electronics to lumber to steel. And that's going to cost us. But who is us? It's not Jeff Bezos and Zuck. It is you. Mm. I don't think uh, Jeff Bezos or Zuck are listening to Collapse Chronicles. <clears throat> That is why prices are soaring. It's not because the economy roared back to life after a corona panic. People did not stop buying microchips or food or lumber or steel. The cause of the great inflation roaring to life is not a sudden spike in demand. It is a shock to supply, one that is not going to end, at least not during our lifetimes, probably. Think of today's price rises as just the front of an immense tsunami stretching long and deep back into the ocean. Let me explain what all this means. <clears throat> what is behind this supply chain crisis? Part of the answer is corona panic, and another big part is climate change. Climate change is essentially why there is a shortage of microchips around the globe. The three primary factories that make microchips all had to shut down. The one in Texas from the snowstorm that destroyed Texas's energy grid, the one in Japan from a fire that took hours to put out, the one in Taiwan from a drought that has starved the factory of the water necessary for production. Corona panic, meanwhile, snarled distribution through a combination of lockdowns and border closures. Put those together and you have got a supply chain crisis of historic proportions. But that is just a tiny, tiny taste of the future. Imagine what happens now as mega fires and mega floods and mega typhoons bite. Now goods have to move across fire and flood belts. Shippers are already charging massively inflated rates. One big reason behind the price spikes now. Imagine what they will charge tomorrow to brave planetary catastrophe. And that's if stuff gets made at all. Climate change essentially took down our capacity to make microchips as a civilization and it has barely even begun. Now guys, I'm just going to break in here. Uh, Umer knows a whole lot more about this subject than I do. I'm just a little bit hitting, for me, to be hitting the alarmist BS button 
just because I am reading this does not uh, mean I agree with everything Umer says. I, I don't know. Maybe everything the man is talking about, uh, about these microchips, uh, because uh, of a three-day snowstorm back in January in Texas and some fire in Japan that took hours to put out. It's not ringing true to me. The microchips thing is not ringing true. I thought microchips were made in Taiwan. But anyway, I'm going to get back to who may. I, I just needed to put in that little amplification and clarification that uh, this is one of the reasons this man is is frequently being uh, called an, an over-alarmist. But since I am an alarmist myself, I'm usually cheering the man on, and he could very well be right. Let's move on beyond microchips. <clears throat> so imagine for a moment how much more expensive stuff is going to be in an age of climate change, ecological collapse, mass extinction, and the nationalism, fascism, and social wreckage that all leaves behind. Harvest will obviously fail as the topsoil turns to dust. Kiss all that cheap food goodbye. Water tables will dry up or be poisoned. Kiss clean, cheap water goodbye. M medicines, plenty of them, come from organic sources. Kiss those goodbye as their raw materials become prohibitively expensive to synthesize and source. Electronics, steel, cement, glass, we do not know how to make them in clean ways, meaning sustainable ways. That means they are incredibly susceptible to natural disasters also. That one region where a key heavy metals available is now underwater or burned to a crisp? Whoops, too bad. I guess the world is not getting glass or electronics this year. Our civilization is a deep and profound economic risk. That is the lesson for now. We are at the beginning of one of the greatest inflationary periods in history. There is no way that basics are not going to get more expensive over the next few decades as supply shock after supply shock eviscerates them. Corona panic is just one tiny egg example of such a supply shock. Sounding like uh, Umer Haik is saying the Corona panic is a bad hair day compared to what is coming down the pike. It's what it sounds like to me, but I am biased. But I am reading Corona Panic is just one tiny example uh, as Corona Panic is a bad hair day. Anyway, enough of the C word. <clears throat> when temperatures rise by two degrees C, and we can't make stuff in parts of the globe that it's now made in, from electronics to clothes to food, our civilization undergoes the greatest supply shock in history. Think about what happened to ancient civilizations. How many of them died off? They too underwent supply shocks. Some had water sources that dried up. Some depleted their resources into oblivion. They didn't all have monetary economies like we do, but the effects 
we're the same as they are already starting to be for us. Shortages, crises, goods not getting where they're needed and used, and used to being had. The consequence of that was disaster. Civilizations simply fell. Cities were abandoned. Wars broke out. Conflicts arose. That is the path we are on. Inflation is no joke to mess around with. Now, I said I had some very bad news. Even though your head is probably spinning already. This, this was not, that was the bad news. Now we're going to get the really bad news. Here it is. Here comes the really bad news. <clears throat> Central banks are about to make inflation much, much worse. They're about to do exactly the wrong thing. And weirder, worse, they know it. What do central banks do to tamp down inflation? They raise interest rates. Get rid of those interest bearing accounts out of your life, as Joe Biden would say. <clears throat> what do central banks do to tamp down inflation? They raise interest rates. Bang! Prices return to normal because higher rates, higher interest rates, mean a slower economy. Money moving through hands less swiftly. At least that's the theory for ordinary times, but these are not ordinary times. There are two kinds of inflation. Inflation caused by spikes in demand and inflation caused by shocks in supply. Now, the theory above was invented for a world in which spikes in demand caused inflation. That is, people suddenly have too much money for whatever reason. There's a boom in the economy thanks to some new labor-saving technology or whatever, which means that there's more of a surplus in society. So. When inflation is caused by spikes in demand, sure, you can raise rates and tamp it down. But that is not the case when inflation is caused by supply shocks. When some vital resource suddenly goes flat, prices surge, not because there's a sudden jump in demand, but because of plain old-fashioned scarcity. Raising interest rates, in this case, when inflation's cost pushed, as economists call it, is a recipe for disaster. I want to make this really, really clear so that everyone understands what might otherwise be a point of arcane economics. If you raise rates when inflation is spiking because of shortages, there is that much less money for households. Now households are paying more interest on everything from mortgages, to credit cards, to cars. But that does not solve the problem of a lack of supply for food or fuel or computer chips. Is there anybody listening to this man who does not get it going into the Christmas shopping season, assuming there is a Christmas shopping season, put that credit card away. Do whatever you can to pay that sucker off. Shred that thing.
all right if you have a whatever your mortgage is sell the damn house and buy you a house that you can afford this is why I live in a 384 square foot shack instead of that 3,000 square foot four bedroom three bath uh, McMansion uh, with the two car garage you know what I'm saying uh, it takes some damn responsibility. Uh, anyway, I'm getting off. Uh, I can see I made my coffee too strong. Let's get back to our economic lesson from Umer. Where were we? Prices do not fall when you raise interest rates in a situation of a sudden shock to supply, whether for computer chips or cars or food or fuel, what do they do? They rise even higher. How can that be? Well, think about it. Now people, you know, because of all of these interests, uh, all of this uh, skyrocketing interest they're paying on uh, their credit cards and mortgages and car payments and whatnot, <clears throat> now people have less money to spend because they are paying more money in interest in all of their debt. So businesses tend to cut back whatever orders they have already placed for the goods already in short supply. Now there is much more risk in it for them, often because goods move through supply chains on credit, which is now more expensive. Bang! That means that prices for people rise because now those goods are in even shorter supply. You know, I, I, I love, uh, I admit guys, I made an A in economics in graduate school. Uh, I, I, I made an A in uh, graduate level economics and statistics. I never had any clue what my professors were talking about. I had no clue what any of this meant. And I was at the top of the class in both classes, and, and uh, I could only imagine what everybody else in the class. Uh, I, I wish Umer had been my teacher. I'm learning more about economics in this one uh, essay than I did in three months of graduate level economics. Okay, class, did you get all that? Just think it through in your own life. Interest rates rise tomorrow. Bang! All that debt service cost you pay suddenly begins to soar. Then you have less money to spend. So does everyone else. But that doesn't affect the level of demand in society for food, fuel, microchips. It stays the same. All it does is raise the cost of doing business, of providing goods through already crisis-stricken supply chains. So, what happens to society at large as a result of all this? Well, austerity sets in. And I'm not going to get off on a rant here on austerity. I, I, I voluntarily had austerity set in in my life 13 years ago. I, I walked away from all of this crap. And this is why I'm living in this little 384 square foot tumble down shack. Uh, you don't need all that crap. You don't need a four-bedroom, three-bath house, uh, you know, and four other rentals in, in, in a goddamn Home Depot credit card with $22,000 on it. Uh, you know, when I'm reading this stuff, I, I, just want, I just want to scream. Take some damn personal responsibility.
cut that crap out of your life, starting, starting with uh, these Christmas presents. My, my Christmas budget for the last 13 years has been zero, zero, zero. Cut that crap out. Call your friends and tell them how much you love them. All right. Anyway, getting back to Umer, I can tell this uh, this coffee is really uh, jacking me up. Where were we? Oh, yes. <clears throat> what happens to society at large as a result of all of this? Well, austerity sets in. As it needs to. Governments cut spending because now interest rates are higher and they have to serve as their debt too. At the same time, societies are getting poorer as they need to do. People are paying more for the same stuff and more for their debt, which means they have less left over to pay their taxes. Ah, shit, I need to go pay my taxes in New York before I head to Florida. What does that add up to? Less social investment. But this is the precise moment at which we need more investment. That is the only solution to the dilemma above. If we cannot stop prices rising when supply shocks hit us by raising interest rates, then how can we? Well, there's only one way. We need to increase supply dramatically. That is the case before us now. The age of apocalypse we are entering is going to cause one of the greatest inflationary surges in history because there will be shortages, very real shortages of everything we are used to, from cheap food, to clean water, to breathable air, to microchips, and steel, and glass, and cement. We need to invest in our fundamental systems so they are capable of providing all of those things at the scale we are used to, but not in the way we are used to. Did you know so far that there is only one clean steel plant in the entire world? He doesn't define the term clean steel. Oh yeah, he has a link to it uh, if you want to find out more about this. Did you know uh, that there is only one clean steel plant in the entire world? We don't know how to make green, clean steel as a civilization. So, of course, though we rely on steel profoundly, our supply of steel is threatened in an age of natural calamity. Do you see the theme here? We need the greatest wave of investment in human history to fight the greatest inflationary surge in human history, a wave of investment that can, for example, result in innovations like green steel and cement and glass, in factories which are not still powered by coal, in food and water systems which can survive the oncoming boiling temperatures headed our way, in